Welcome to the Confessing Art Trust. I'm Andy Slavin, the Executive Director, and in a moment I'll be giving you a tour of our inaugural exhibition, A Lasting Friendship, Gerard Confessing and Dale Chihuly. But first I would like to tell you a little bit about who we are and what we do. Uh, the Confessing Art Trust essentially is a home to one man's personal collection of art and decorative objects that he amassed over his lifetime. That man was Gerard Confessing. He was originally born and raised in Brooklyn, New York, um, and grew up during the Depression. Um, at that time, he would often visit the Met Museum because he loved being surrounded by artwork, and it created a lifelong passion for art, and eventually collecting it. Um, his background in education is actually in law, um, but when he decided to not pursue a law career, he ended up working for West Publishing. And it was West Publishing that eventually transferred him and his family here to the Twin Cities in the early 1960s. Uh, West Publishing is a vast uh, company uh, known for its publications of legal uh, documents and legal books. And Jerry ended up becoming the executive vice president in marketing for the company. Uh, he then eventually uh, was able to retire, and that was well and before Thomson Reuters had purchased them. But when he passed away in 2013, he left behind this large collection of many, many kinds of objects, including fine art, and the family had to figure out what to do with all of it. So some of it was here in Minnesota, some of it was in Naples, Florida, and some of it was even in a museum that he founded in Yerevan, Armenia. Uh, eventually, the family was able to bring most of the work back here to Minnesota, and they found a location that was in close proximity to where the family still lives in this northern suburban area above St. Paul. And wanted to house the entire collection here, but it was originally just going to become a warehouse. Uh, fortunately, the family decided to include a rotating gallery space so that the public could come and enjoy aspects of the collection throughout the year. I'm standing next to the Confestian Chandelier. It was created by Dale Chihuly in 1994 and was originally installed in Jared Confestian's original winter home down in Scottsdale, Arizona. As you can see, it's composed of hundreds of different elements that are all individually blown and then wired to an armature to create the overall chandelier shape. The colors are meant to reflect the colors and patterns that you would see in the Southwest, and so the family nickname for this piece is the Chili Pepper. Welcome to Lasting Friendship, Gerard Confession and Dale Chihuly. Uh, this exhibit uh, features predominantly um, over 40 pieces that we have in our collection by Dale Chihuly uh, in the overall collection of over 3,000 objects, which may not seem like a lot in context, but this is actually a very deep collection of one artist within our facility here. The collection uh, and what we're showing and the reason why we're showing it is because um, like some of the other exhibitions you might encounter of Dale Chihuly elsewhere in his museums and botanical gardens, this particular collection reflects a very long friendship that went on for about 30 years. Uh, Jerry was very close to Dale and collected accordingly. Um, purchasing installations and, uh, and individual works for his homes here uh, in Minnesota, also in Scottsdale, Arizona, and then even later in Naples, Florida. Um, so we were really excited to be able to showcase just the breadth of this collection, but also some of the individual components of our files and ephemera that we have that you normally wouldn't get to see, where you see letters between the two, uh, even a great snapshot of them back in the 90s. And I wanted people to understand just how special this particular collection was uh, in that context. The pieces uh, that you see in this exhibit uh, are of various series throughout Chihuly's career uh, that he works in. And series are kind of like a way for Dale to create a set of parameters for himself and explore all the opportunities within that. And Jerry really paid um, very good attention to getting great examples of different objects within those series of Chihuly's. Uh, there's also a few series that you don't normally see when you go into exhibitions. So I was again also very excited to be able to showcase that as well. Installed above our heads is what's called the Pergola Ceiling. Again, also by Dale Chihuly, but this piece was made in 1999 and it was originally created to be installed 
at Jerry Kefestian's house in Naples, Florida. It was a condo that he had, and this was suspended above his dining room table. The fun things to know about this is that these are all individually hand-blown objects by Chihuly and his team, and there's well over 250 of them. Also, these pieces are not glued together or adhered in any way. They're just nested together above clear planes of glass. And furthermore, there is no map to these types of installations. Uh, every time a Chihuly installation travels that looks like this, it tends to alter a little bit. And that's intentional by the artist because he loves that it's an organic way of looking at the installation as a kind of almost like a living thing, the fact that it can better adapt to the location that it's going to be installed next time. So as I said before, the exhibit is grouped by series that the artist works in, and um, it's basically exploring all the possibilities within a set of parameters that Chihuly's created for himself. The first series that he created was called Cylinders back in 1971. And this particular piece, Black Cylinder number 46, is from 2006. So first of all, you can see that the artist still regularly works in this particular series. Uh, what I like to draw attention to is that the cylinder is really meant to be a canvas or a jumping off point for what Chihuly likes to refer to as the glass drawing on the surface. Where you're looking at the little squares of red and orange with dots of blue and white in them, that's to indicate patterns of what Dale really loves to collect called Pendleton trade blankets. And he really loves the, the weaving of them, the patterns, and the variety of colors that, that they come in. And so it's one way of paying homage to them. Where you see the threads of glass going down and across, that's to recreate the weaving of the blanket itself. So this is the warp and the weft. But like many of things that Chihuly makes, uh, they, there's an opportunity for a series to evolve into another one. And that's what we have here with these two objects. These are called Jerusalem cylinders, and they were inspired by an opportunity that Dale was able to have where he could install and mount a major exhibition in Jerusalem at the Tower of David back in 1999. The pieces themselves um, really are kind of Dale's musing on the fact that 1999 was the turn of the millennium, but also thinking about the fact that while we're going into a new thousand year period, this is a city that's already thousands of years old to begin with. So if you look at it like this, think of the cylinder itself as representing modernity or potential maybe, yet it's still attached to the ancient. That's what the crystals are here for. I also think it's a nod to the human history of working in glass, which goes back 5,000 years to ancient Mesopotamia, and where we think we found the first or at least earliest examples of human blowing glass is the Phoenician culture in northern Israel and down to Jerusalem. And I really particularly love this series because of all of that meaning and uh, exploration kind of compacted into these works. Next, I'm going to talk about the Basket series. Um, the Baskets, um, Dale began this series in the late 70s, and it was after he paid a visit to the Historical Society and Heritage Museum of Washington. And when they were touring him through the back storage areas, he encountered a room filled with shelves that housed their collection of Pacific Northwest Indigenous Peoples baskets. And um, what really captured Chihuly's attention was after all these years of age and deterioration and really chiefly gravity having an effect on the forms of the baskets that the surface started to have like an undulation to it and Julie thought that looked very sculptural so he decided he wanted to recreate that effect in his glass and he was able to do so by keeping his glass very hot and very thin but allowing gravity and centrifugal force to manipulate the surface. So that's how he's achieving these ripples here. Also, because of the organic approach that he's doing in this process uh, to create his baskets, there's that asymmetry you're starting to see here show up. And all of that combined 
really becomes a breakthrough for Chihuly, and it's an approach with glass that he carries on throughout the, his career in the medium. Uh, I love talking about this particular piece. Uh, Cinnabar Basket here is a great example of early baskets by Chihuly. This particular one's from 1978. And there's a couple of features in here. And one of them is the fact that it's from 1978. It's right on the cusp of when Chihuly was no longer able to physically blow glass and he required his team to do that while he directed them. But the other thing I like about this is if you look and see how the ripples in this surface are more consistent, it's because the main factor here is not gravity like it is in the first one. Uh, in this case, it's an early example of Chihuly exploring what optic molds can do with his glass. And this particular optic mold will give ridges to the surface like you see here. And it's a dual effect that he's going for. One, when he uh, wraps thread of uh, color bar glass around the bubble after they put it into the mold, you end up with these little lines on the surface that kind of recreate that wall of the basket. The other thing about this uh, particular kind of mold is that when it creates those ridges that you see, it actually reinforces the glass, so it gives them uh, a structure. And it allows you to blow the glass out much larger, but still keep it paper thin. And the more he worked with those uh, molds and recreated that effect in his glass baskets, the less they started to look like baskets for Dale. And that leads us to the next series. As I was saying, those molds that he was using made the baskets feel less like themselves. But they started to resemble something coming from the water, which is a huge inspiration for Dale. So by taking adva advantage of that technology and the work that it was doing to the surface and creating those ripples and ridges, Dale decided to really push out and emphasize that effect and explore how he could really start to make the viewer feel like they were seeing something from the water. And that's how he developed his C-Form series in 1981. This particular piece from 1984, you can see now those ridges are incredibly pronounced and it does feel like we're looking at a clamshell or maybe a sand dollar or even a sea biscuit. Yet in between those ridges, the glass is still paper, paper thin so that it really gives you that sense of lightness, that effervescence that Chihuly is looking to achieve and why he likes working with glass as a sculptural medium so much. As I said, this one's from 1984, and this piece is from 1989. So really excellent examples of sea forms from the early era. Now to discuss the Persian series that Dale created uh, back in the mid 80s, I'll start with talking about this piece here, Confetti Persian set from 1982. Um, the Persian series can be a little bit difficult to explain, but essentially Chihuly was looking to create new forms in glass and a new series. And so he was reading up on and researching things like mosaics from the Byzantine Empire and studying the abstract floral patterns in Persian rugs. So the name is of Persians is really a hope to evoke that aesthetic from that region in that time period. Um, and they are really named for the interior components, but then of course, Chugli always creates the base piece to house it. But what I really like using this piece to talk about are my two favorite quotes by Dale Chihuly. One, I've never met a color I didn't like. That's clearly evident here. The other one is, no matter what I'm making, I'm thinking about how it occupies the space, which is a very eye-opening quote by Chihuly because it really helps you understand that his approach to sculpture goes back all the way to his original studies in architecture and interior design. So his understanding of space is what informs his sculpture. And I think it just means it's inevitable that he would eventually figure out a way to make his own glasswork architectural. And that's what we have here with the Kefestian Persian wall. 
This installation was also created for the Winter Home in Scottsdale in 1994, along with our chandelier that you saw in the lobby. And I love this installation because there is a couple of things going on here. I think that you can really see by this example of how Chihuly is really pushing the material and pushing his team to see how large they can go with these blown glass pieces. On top of that, I really like the variety of color that is going on here. The fact that you have blues with oranges and reds and persimmon and ambers and golds and even brown. And what I really think is important about that and having that variety of color is that the other half of this installation is the effect that it has on the wall with all of its reflections. So the fact that you can start to mix the colors here on the wall because of the light, I think really makes for a much more beautiful installation overall. This grouping is of our collection of what Chihuly calls his Venetian series. The name comes from a trip that Dale took to Venice, uh, this time in 1988, and while he was there, he visited a museum that just so happened to have their collection of vases that were created during the Art Deco period on the island of Murano. Now, the artist loves Art Deco, and he really fell in love with these vases, so he wanted to pay homage to them. And in order to do so, he really wanted to work with an amazing gaffer um, named Lino Tagli Pietro. And uh, Lino has been working in the industry for many, many years. In fact, he just retired last year at the age of 84. And it was a really incredible collaboration of Lino working with Dale to make these Venetians for him. Uh, this particular Venetian that we have here is a great example of early Venetians. Uh, I feel like you can really see the Art Deco influence in them that's incredibly strong. Um, but I also love that right next to it, we have this collection of what Chihuly refers to as his Piccolo Venetians. Now the Piccolo Venetians are just baby Venetians in that sense. However, in the few years that they evolve, you can see that that asymmetry that we've been looking at in all of the other works that is so characteristic of the artist has now found its way into the pieces themselves. So. You can still see the Art Deco, but now this is very strong Chihuly. The next two Venetians that we have are uh, a series within a series. These particular Venetians were part of what Chihuly called his Silver series that he did from 2009 to 2011. And it was an exploration of what would happen if Chihuly applied this antique form of mirroring process to his sculptures and that effect that it might create. So they began with Venetians and his team would blow the vessels clear and you know, create amazing bright colored adornments that Dale would direct them to put on the surface. But then after it cooled, they would then pour silver nitrate on the inside. And that's how you're getting this mirror process. Chihuly really loved the results and went on to do a huge body of silvered works, including silvered Venetians, silvered cylinders, silver Jerusalem cylinders, even chandeliers. And it is really a powerful collection. It also caused Dale to go back to his archives and review some of the Venetians that he had sitting there from when he began this series in the late 80s and early 90s. And I think this is a really good example of that. Um, it was, for whatever reason, he just decided not to show them or what, whatever might have occurred at the time. Maybe there was something that just wasn't quite there. But applying that silvering process to the interior of the Venetian was like a completion of the thought. So even though this might have been started, so to speak, by being blown in the early 90s, it was finally completed in 2000. This particular series is called Pudi by Chihuly. And Pudi is essentially Italian for cherubs, plural. Uh, really, this came about because Dale just loved the energy and the playful nature of Pudi in Italian paintings. You see them often in historical paintings or in the frescoes. And Chihuly thought they would look really 
amazing if they were made in glass. Uh, so he again worked with an amazing gaffer known for his hot glass sculpting skills, and that was Pino Cigaretto. This is incredibly complex work to make because there are no molds really used in the making of this piece. There may have been a stamp that they used to create the ripples in the sash, but that's largely it. Um, the rest of this is freehand hot sculpted glass. And the tools, many of the tools, that glass blowers use these days have not changed that much in the past 1500 years. So the predominant tool that Pino would have been working on uh, to sculpt this for Chiguli based on his drawings are called jacks, which look like tweezers, but they're about this big. And it's with those jacks that he is getting all of the twists of hair, shaping the face, pulling down the arm and bending it at the elbow, creating all of these features here, and working with temperatures between 950 to 2100 degrees Fahrenheit. So it really takes incredible skill to be able to create these pieces. Dale loved how they came out, and so much so that he decided to incorporate them into other series that he was creating at the time in the 90s. And for instance, like here, we have this amazing Venetian Icabana, where it has this wonderful floral motif of this vine coming here in the sort of rainbow pattern, jewel tones uh, with gold foil of the leaves, yet we have these really playful and wonderful pooty attached to the stem of it. Now you can see that in addition to the Venetian Icabana and using floral motifs, uh, Chihuly's also taken inspiration from things like Audubon prints to uh, use as renderings and source material to work and create birds with pooties like we have here, this beautiful pelican with a pooty on its back and one in its mouth. And here, uh, a lobster with two pooty. We also have a pooty hanging out on a heron's nest. And then last but not least, we have another of the Venetian Icabanas with a pooty on it. So you can see how he really must have enjoyed working with these particular little fellows and incorporating them into additional sculptures as he's going through. These two works are a part of what Dale Chigley refers to as this black series that he did from 2006 to 2008, and kind of like the silver series that he did later. Um, it was an opportunity to take one theme and approach all of his previous series with it. So the themes were use this new opaque black that had just come out onto the market and go big and sculptural. Um, so he did black baskets, black Venetians, chandeliers, etc. But I really love the black series that he did of just sea life. And you can see here, he's really gone in a very ambitious way uh, in terms of scale that he was able to achieve with his team in hot glass sculpture. I really love the addition of the clear glass support structure that gives that kind of airy quality that makes it feel like the animals are actually swimming or moving, uh, but yet still keeping with the theme of being under the water. I think these are probably two of the best examples of the Black Sea Life pieces that I've seen in person. Uh, so I'm really grateful that we have them in our collection. In conjunction with the major installations and pedestal sculptures that we have in this collection, I'm really thrilled to be able to showcase a lot of the ephemera that we have in our files and in our storage cabinets. And what I'm talking about really is the correspondence and gifts and various things that Jerry and Dale uh, gave to one another over the many years that they were friends. Um, you'll see behind me that we have several framed images and those are actually faxes that Chihuly sent to Jerry as a form of correspondence, his favorite way of communicating with his collectors and friends. And then we also have some objects that are every day that Chihuly used as a means to communicate or um, just illustrate and make fun gifts for them. And so you can see we have some linen dinner napkins as well as some bread and butter plates from various restaurants. Um, I think it's pretty great to be able to showcase these, uh, not just because it shows how close the connection was, but also I think that 
as a viewer, I hope you see that this is a glimpse into Chihuly's creative process. He was well known for many years and still does to this day using sketches that he would put on fax paper to be the instructions for his team of ideas and concepts for exhibitions and uh, permanent installations that he would send back to his team while Dale would be on site. And it would allow the team in Seattle to be able to prep things so when Dale got back, he could begin working on those projects and exhibitions. So it's not every day you get to see those kinds of elements to the background of Dale's thinking process. So I hope you'd enjoy that. Some of the drawings in our collection that Dale created that are actually illustrations of installations he wanted to create for Jerry's home in Scottsdale, his original winter home. And um, Dale's drawings are, well, they began when Dale had lost a sight in his left eye in a car accident and then two years later dislocated his shoulder. Those two accidents made it really difficult, if not impossible, for him to be able to continue to blow blast himself. So luckily his team was able to take over for him and they used Dale's drawings as part of their instructions where Dale acts like a conductor or movie director and uses these as sort of the script by which to run. And the drawings themselves all indicate a different installation. So this one says Cafestian Ikebana, Ikebana being a floral motif that Chihuly works throughout his uh, different sculptures and that installation that is actually still in our storage. We didn't have enough space for it in this exhibition. But as you remember from the piece we talked about in the lobby, the Confession Chandelier, now you can see the drawing that corresponds to it and you get a glimpse into how Chihuly was thinking about where it was going to be located in the home. And one of my favorite features is you see there's a second floor landing and a spiral staircase. And I really think the people that he's showing here in this drawing are him indicating the various vantage points in which you'd be able to engage with the sculpture once it was installed in place. The last one that we have, Confession Backyard, consists of people in the yard with what Chihuly refers to as his Nishima floats, large glass spheres that he makes. And Unfortunately, Jerry at the end decided he didn't want to commission this particular installation. So even though we don't have it, I love that we have this wonderful rendering in the painting of it. Well, thank you so much for joining me today and all of us here at the Confessing Art Trust in this video tour. I hope you really enjoyed and I do hope that in the future you're able to come visit us in person. Uh, in the meantime, please feel free to sign up for our mailing list or follow us on our social media and I look forward to seeing you soon.